What were you doing 20 years ago? Were you even alive 20 years ago? Let me paint a picture for you. It was 2003. A loaf of bread cost 57p. The final Lord of the Rings film, hopefully the final Lord of the Rings film, won 11 Oscars. England had just won the World Cup, the Rugby World Cup, that is. George Bush was president and Tony Blair was prime minister. And if you wanted to watch a movie, you'd take a walk to Blockbuster and you'd get one of these new fancy things called DVDs. 20 years is a long, long time. And time can do all sorts of things. It can change us. It can change our circumstances and our priorities can change in that time. But 20 years had passed since the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this man called Paul and his companions were still wanting to make his name known. It wasn't old news to them. It wasn't nostalgic to them. It wasn't something in the distant past. It was the most important thing in the world. And by 53 AD, they'd gotten as far as a place called Philippi. Philippi was a, a city founded about 400 years before that. Unsurprisingly, maybe it was named after someone called Philip. It was the father of Alexander the Great, who it was named after. And it was like a mini Rome. Rome was the capital of the world. And uh, Philippi was like a mini Rome. Despite there being 800 miles between the two places, it was ruled by the Romans. It reflected a Roman lifestyle, Roman politics, and Roman architecture. And you may have been here in church last month when our very own Joel Williams and our visiting speaker, Arian from Phoenician, they both spoke about things that happened in this city. They spoke about what happened when Paul and his companions arrived in Philippi. We saw three very different people that they encountered. There was a, a rich businesswoman called Lydia. There was a demon-possessed slave girl. And there was a, a prison guard. And they all had their lives transformed by Jesus. And soon there was a, a fully fledged church in this place. And it was a healthy church. And this letter was written about 10 years after that. And circumstances have changed once again. Paul is now under house arrest. He's surrounded by Roman guards. We don't know exactly where he was but we know that he wasn't concerned about himself. His priority was writing this letter, this letter of encouragement and instruction to a church that was very close to his heart. And the key theme in this letter is joy. And this series is called Real Joy. Because when you read this letter, you get a sense of the joy that Paul had because of what Jesus had done in his life. If you've got this letter in front of you in, in, in your Bibles, look at chapter 4 and verse 4. I would say it sums up the whole letter for you. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. We will see that joy is not a, an emotion or a mood when things are going our way but a posture that the Christian has and can possess in every circumstance as a result of what God has done in their lives. And the first of our messages from this letter will look at what Paul had in mind while he was praying for this church. Why was Paul able to pray for these people who we hadn't seen for such a long time? So first of all, we need to see what the foundation of Paul's prayer was. We need to know what made Paul, uh, what made Paul uh, pray in this way. And so let's look at these, these three things that are a foundation for his prayer. And the first of these things is there in verse one. He's a, a bond servant. He's a slave to Christ. The letter opens in the most typical way that it could do. 
in a first century letter. It tells us who it's from. These days, when we finish a letter, we put it at the bottom. I don't know why we do that, but it's more helpful, isn't it, to have right from the start who it's from. It tells us who it's for, and then he gives a greeting. The letter is, is from Paul. He mentions Timothy as well. It wasn't written by Timothy, but he wanted them to know that Timothy uh, was, was on, the, on the same page as Paul, and Paul was planning to send Timothy to their church soon. And the reason he is able to pray for this church and care for them is because he is a slave of Christ. His identity is wrapped up in who he follows, not in his needs, not in who he is, but who Christ is. He longs to be able to do what Jesus wants him to do. And he extends there in verse two, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's showing them the same grace and peace that he has been shown by Jesus. So that's the first thing. Second layer of, of the foundation for Paul's praying for them is joy. If you want to uh, do something uh, this afternoon, if you're finished with Daniel 2 and you want the next assignment, read this whole letter and, and see how many times you see the word joy or rejoice. It comes up so often. And, and Paul is able to pray for this church because he they give him such joy. Look at there in verse four. Always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. He gave he gave thanks for them every time that he prayed for them. And he prayed for them often in the trials that Paul was facing. Uh, the work that had gone in uh, to that distant place brought a smile to his face. Remembering the way in which uh, the Lord had worked in the life of Lydia as they met there by the riverside. Uh, the kindness and the warmth that Paul had been shown by Lydia. And then he remembered the trouble that they had faced when uh, that uh, they had uh, uh, passed out the demons from that slave girl. They remembered the way that they had unlawfully been sent to prison and yet had joyfully sung songs together in that cell. They re he remembered how God had sent an earthquake to set them free from that prison. And of course, he remembered the prison guards whose life had been transformed when he asked that question, what must I do to be saved? So no wonder Paul was filled with joy. It was a church with an amazing backstory and they had kept on going he knew some of them by name I'm sure but there were others there that had joined in that last 10 years but Paul still cared for each and every one of them in chapter 4 and verse 1 he refers to them in a wonderful way he calls them my joy and my crown they had such a special place in his heart which leads to our our third foundation for Paul's prayers, that they had, he had a genuine love for the people. Paul's love for the Philippians is so clear when you read this letter. Verse seven says, uh, I have you in my heart. And verse eight says, for God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. When you read the different letters that Paul wrote to different churches, there are different dynamics at work. Each church, you see, was different, and Paul had a different relationship with each of these churches. Uh, if you read the letters to the church in Corinth, there's all sorts of messy situations going on there, so Paul has to address those. Uh, when he writes to the Romans, he'd never met them before, so again, that's a different dynamic. And when he speaks to the Galatians, there were some serious issues that needed to be addressed there and then. But the Philippian church was different to all of these. Uh, they loved and they respected Paul, and they seemed to be thriving. So Paul thanks them there in verse 5. He thanks them for their partnership. He thanks them for their fellowship in the gospel. You see, that there aren't any solo Christians. If you've met a Christian who says, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church, I don't need church, then they need to think about those things again. That's not what the Bible teaches. You can't exist in a vacuum, in a bubble, away from a church. Uh, that means uh, for all the missionaries that we support, 
We pray for them and we support them and we ask how they're doing for Sean and, and for Miska and Alison and Alan and Pat in, in France and others. And it, it's the same for our church family, isn't it? We meet together because we are a body. A Christian without a church is like uh, an ear or a hand or a, or a nose that you find on the floor. I hope this has never happened to you, by the way. They're wonderful when, it's, when they're attached to the body, but when you find them severed somewhere else, call the police. Um, and also, it's wrong, isn't it? You just know that it, it can't be used anymore. It can't function. We need to be united together. You can't be an ear or a nose or a hand on your own. You need to be connected to a body. And although uh, Paul was clearly there at the beginning of this church's life, it was never Paul's work. Isn't that wonderful? It's a good thing that this wasn't Paul's church because he was now hundreds of miles away. He would soon be executed. But he knows that the work will continue long after he's gone. Lives will continue to be changed. There in verse six, he's able to say that he is confident that God will finish the work that he started. Um, Kat sometimes, Kat is my wife, and she sometimes calls me half a job Brady um, because I, I've got a really good heart, I think, and I, I try and help around the house and I, I start things. Um, I take the clothes off the line, for example. Um, and I'm really chuffed with myself for taking the clothes off the line, but I just leave them in the basket there and hope that the the, uh, the laundry fairies will do the rest. Or I'll, maybe I'll sort dinner. I'll say, don't worry, you just relax. I'll sort dinner. Uh, and then I somehow use every single pan in the house. Uh, I don't do any of the washing up and I leave every cupboard door open. Um, so I try and be a help, but Pat is actually left with more work than she would if she did it herself. Uh, what we have here with God is, is, is not half a job. God always finishes the work he starts. If there is a church in Philippi, it will be there until God wants it to be there. And that is the same for us today. God always finishes the work he starts. When everything is looking bleak and hopeless in your Christian life, God hasn't abandoned you. He's still at work. He will finish what he began. So those are the foundations for Paul's prayer. Those three things, hopefully Brilliant. They're on the screen behind me. I'm always scared to check, but they are there. Fantastic. So those are the three wonderful foundations for Paul's prayer. But now I want to look at the content of Paul's prayer. What does he actually pray for? We sometimes ask that, don't we? Uh, how can I pray for you? What can I be praying for? Or someone sometimes asks us, well, what can I be praying for you? And, and you sometimes don't know what to say. Well, Paul gives the Philippians an insight in how he prays for them. And as I was studying this passage this week, the, the biggest challenge I felt was that our prayers are often too small. They're too small. Now, God cares about every aspect of our lives, every detail. And it's, it's good to pray for the little things as well, about the, the people in our, in our lives who uh, are tricky and, and uh, the situations at work which God cares about and the people who are unwell. But Paul's main focus for the people that he is praying for is for them to grow in their faith, for there to be progress in their Christian lives. So I want to look at this prayer that Paul prays, and I want us to notice four things, four things that we can certainly be praying for ourselves, but also for our families and for our friends and for our brothers and sisters here in Emmanuel. The first thing he prays for is that they be abounding in love. Verse nine, uh, you can see that he prays that they would be abounding in love. And sometimes uh, the most straightforward sounding commands are the hardest to keep. When God gave his people the law in the Old Testament, he told them to love God and to love others. He said, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love the neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And Jesus had the exact same message when he was teaching. He said, you can sum up the whole Old Testament in this way. If you've got a Bible and you see how big it is, that first massive chunk is the Old Testament. And he said, Jesus says, you can sum it up 
really simply. Love God and love others as much as you love yourself. If you want to hear what God wants you to hear this morning, I can tell you confidently four words. Love God, love others. Loving God, we think that's that's easy. He's wonderful. He's perfect. He made everything. Loving other people. We know how hard that can be. Why? Why is loving so hard to do? It's because of everyone else, isn't it? Everyone else is the problem. People are hard to love. But when we think about it, is everyone else really the problem? No, you and I are the issue as well, aren't we? It's hard to love people who are impatient, who are unreasonable, who are irrational and picky and hard-hearted. I'm looking above you now, so I'm not looking at people when I'm saying these things. Overly sensitive and stubborn and lazy. And if you're anything like me, you'll be thinking, oh, this describes that person. This describes him or her. But I want you to stop and think, this is talking about me. That's why we need to pray, isn't it? We can't abound in love for others without God's help. We need divine intervention. That's what we need to grow in love for others. Because it doesn't happen naturally. It's a a supernatural thing. And it can never reach a point where we've completed it. We can never think, oh, I've done enough now. I've got this whole love thing nailed down. But that's why Paul says that your love may abound still more. So even if you're already brilliant at loving others, there is never a point where you have done enough. We can never be content with the level that we've reached. Our love must keep growing and growing and growing. Because in our sinful nature, we try and do the bare minimum, don't we? Can I just love those who are easy to love? But one of the most well-known parts of the Bible, the most well-known stories comes from someone who had this same question. Uh, When Jesus had said, love your neighbors, this guy had asked, but who is my neighbor? He's asking, who can I get away with not loving? And Jesus, of course, gives the story of the good Samaritan, showing that being a good neighbor is about even loving our enemies. And the problem is that we think we're easy to love and everyone else is the problem. And in doing that, we forget what Christ did for us. We forget that the problems that we came with, the sin that defined us. We forget that God forgave us even in our darkest moments and that he loved us despite us hating him. And so as a result of the love that we have been shown by God, we are to love others in the same way. Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, get rid of all bitterness rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. So we forgive and we love others because that's what's been done to us. Understand, we're not just following an example, but we've been utterly transformed by the Lord. We have a new nature, which means that Uh, We now long to do all that God wants for us to do. It it starts in us and it ought to overflow into the lives of others. So pray that it would increase. Pray that uh, you would have a, a bigger capacity to love others and that it would grow in others too. How can other people know that you're a Christian? It's not what you fill in your census report. It's not by a cross on your necklace or a on a tattoo. It's not through sharing Bible verses on your Instagram. It's not by being here every Sunday. As helpful as some of those things might be, that is not what people will see and think, oh, they're a Christian. The way that people will see that you are truly different to everyone else is by you how you love other believers. This is what Jesus says to his disciples. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If You love one another. When people see Christians united together, sharing their lives together, being kind to one another, being sacrificial to each each other, they, they, they think there's something different about that group of people. 
So how can we do that practically? Well, we can forgive those who have hurt us. We can check in on people who we think might be struggling. We can give lifts to people to church. We can cook meals for people. We can take an interest in other people's lives. We can look to see who sat on their own today. Who's not talking to anyone? Maybe I should go over and chat to them. We can ask questions to people and then follow up the next week. How did that get on? How did he get on there? We can um, offer to babysit or to feed the fish when someone's on holiday. We can encourage someone who's not doing so well. We can offer to take the bill. When you're eating out together, you can celebrate with those who are celebrating. We can weep with those who are weeping. We can pray with someone when they're going through hard times. We can point them to Jesus. All these things are wonderful displays of what Christ has done for us. And we need the Lord's help in doing these things. That's the first thing, that we'd be abounding in love. The second thing Paul prays for is that we'd be discerning. Paul wants the love that they show to be done with knowledge and discernment. You see, Christian love isn't blind love. It's not a head in the clouds. I'll be kind to everyone and I'll be nice to everyone. I'll not think about what I'm doing. Now, Lord, would you give us discernment? Would you give us knowledge? Would you help us to, to judge correctly how to treat others in different situations? Who needs particular care? And what's the best approach for this person? Some people need to be told things gently, while others need clarity and firmness. That's not to mean that we become skeptical and suspicious. It's not to mean that we keep our love back for special occasions. As always, we see this in the life of Jesus most perfectly. He wasn't a robot who treated every person exactly the same at all times. The way Jesus interacted with different people in the Gospels was influenced by their backstory, by their temperaments, by their backgrounds. He's able to be firm but fair to uh, Nicodemus the Pharisee. He's able to ask difficult questions to the lady by the well and then offer her eternal life. He is fiercely protective of the prostitutes and the tax collectors who have put their trust in him. He's gentle and he is encouraging and welcoming to the little children, while at the same time he shows authority and serious warnings to the religious leaders. His concern in all these things was always giving God the glory, and he was always motivated by love. But he always showed knowledge and discernment in the way that he did that. In the Proverbs, we read that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. Therefore, to be discerning, to be knowledgeable, is to make decisions based on what God would have us do, not one what other people might think of us when we do those things. So I think this morning, are my motivations for these things are my motives influenced by what people will think of me with my reputation within this within this church or is it what god would want me to do let's pray for for discernment that we would approve the things that are excellent as it says in verse 10 thirdly he he wants them to be pure and blameless or as our version says sincere and without offense how can we even consider being pure and blameless when we live today? Well, it's only by God's grace, isn't it? The answer is not from running away from the world, by not taking part, by living in a, in a hermited Christian community that totally misses the point that sin arises from our hearts. It doesn't arise on, it doesn't originate on the TV screen. It doesn't originate from the betting shop or, or from the pubs and the clubs. It arises from in here, doesn't it? So how are we to be blameless and pure? Well, it's only through Jesus, isn't it? It's only through uh, Christ-like honesty that we would not live double lives, that our Sunday selves would match up with what we're like the rest of the week, that we wouldn't be hypocrites and hold others up to some impossible standard that we can't keep ourselves, but that we would be sincere that we'd be quick to confess when we're struggling, that we've done wrong and we'd be quick to forgive others 
when they have wronged us. The word blameless describes not stumbling and not causing others to stumble. And the only way for us to achieve not stumbling is, is where we're looking. Where are you looking this morning? If you're running and you look down at your feet, or so I've been told, um, you get distracted by what is going on around you. If you look around, the London Marathon's going on as we speak. And if you uh, look around you at, at uh, some of the distracting costumes maybe, or, or the, the weird people in fancy dress, or whatever it is that might distract you, you will eventually fall. If you look towards the finish line and the end of the race, then you will run with purpose. And that's what we're called to do in our Christian lives. We will make mistakes. We will falter, but there is more grace in the Lord Jesus Christ than there is sin in you. But in order for us to finish the race as well as we can, we need to look at Jesus. Because he's the one who's finished the race already and it was encouraging us, but he's also the prize for winning the race. He is our prize for finishing too. So make sure you're looking ahead of you at Christ so that you would not stumble. And fourthly and finally, the last thing Paul prays for in this wonderful prayer is for fruits of righteousness. What are fruits of righteousness? Well, the image of, of fruit is one that's used in the Bible so many times. Uh, it's a helpful image because trees don't grow fruit on their own, do they? They don't congratulate themselves for being able to grow fruit. The tree cannot sprout apples uh, by themselves in a darkened room. Uh, the vine cannot bear grapes by trying its best to be a good grape uh, bearing vine. No, they're totally dependent on other factors, aren't they? A farmer who knows what he's doing, uh, they need sunlight and they need rain. They need to be planted in the right kind of soil. They need to be protected from pests. They need to be pruned when there are damaged or diseased branches. And that's why it's such a wonderful image that the Bible returns to time and time again. Because for us to grow and to be fruitful followers of Jesus, we need the master gardener, Jesus himself, to be helping us. We need to be watered and to be fed and given light as we come and gather together on a Sunday. We need his protection from threats. We need his pruning, which can be painful. We need him to cut the things out of our lives that we don't need. It will always hurt, but it will always be for our benefits. And when we're connected to the true vine, as he says in John 15, then others will begin to see fruit bearing. So the next time you pray for someone, or maybe you've got a prayer list, if you haven't got one, there's, I think they're by their door as you come in. Pray for them. If someone is frustrating you or someone you care deeply for, or the next time someone asks, how can I pray for you? You can tell them exactly what you'd like to be prayed for. Would you pray that I'd be abounding in love? Would you pray that I would show good discernment? That I would make wise decisions? Would you pray that I would be pure and blameless? And that I would be filled with fruits of righteousness? And I would do these things through Christ. And we're going to close by singing a song that shows that we can do none of this apart from through Christ Jesus. So as we sing this song, let's dwell upon the things that we have learned this morning. And let's put these things into action. Uh, as we uh, share tea and coffee and, uh, with each other afterwards, let's encourage one another, build each other up. Uh, and uh, point one another towards Christ. Let's stand and sing together, and we'll remain standing as I pray afterwards. Mm -hmm.